Hello and welcome to the Modern Adventurer podcast, coming up. The current was so, so strong that my goggles are going and my regs are going and I just start, I'm starting to feel that fear, you know, the visibility's really dropped and it's just, it felt like I was being hit by like 70 mile an hour winds. On today's show, we have Charlie Young, also known as Ocean Magpie. She is a marine biologist and has traveled all over the world with her adventures and seen some of the most spectacular things. On today's podcast, we talk about her dives and some of the amazing work that she is doing in conservation. I am delighted to introduce Charlie Young to the show. Hi, thank you so much for having me. No worries. Well, great to have you on. And I came across you recently and I was really intrigued to find out, you know, some of the adventures that you've been doing with your work as a marine biologist, which has taken you all over the world. I suppose probably the best place to start is with you and how you got into it all. Yeah, so, well, I mean, my obsession with nature started, like, I guess, many people that have sort of moved into this the same career path with just, you know, watching documentaries as a child, becoming obsessed with David Attenborough, and then made the decision to go to university, study conservation biology. And it was really through that degree that I, I guess I decided that I wanted to pursue, you know, marine sciences. And so I've been lucky enough ever since I've graduated over the last five, six years to just travel the world, like you say, to so many different places. I've been lucky enough to live and work in the Red Sea, in Indonesia, um, in Australia. And all of my work is really focused on assessing human impacts in our oceans. That's what I'm most passionate about is understanding how humans are sort of, you know, impacting and and threatening biodiversity in our oceans. And so, yeah, I I specialized in marine science during my master's degree at Glasgow University. Um, And then, yeah, have just used it to take me all over the world and go on amazing adventures and tell impactful stories about wildlife. Amazing. And so was this um, at a young age? Did you have access to the ocean and were able to explore Yes, I was practically made to grow up in a wetsuit. So I'm from Pembrokeshire and um, it's a beautiful part of Wales. I mean, you know, I, I lived right next to the sea, I used to spend every given moment in it. And my family's got a long history and a long connection with it. But yeah, my dad would have us in wetsuits every weekend. We'd go camping in a beautiful place called St. David's and go to a wonderful spot that's now become extremely popular called the Blue Lagoon um, and go jumping off of the cliffs there together. So yeah, I was very much just thrown in the deep end as a child and, and made to fall in love with the ocean. And my dad was also a BZAC instructor. So I remember going to the pool as a child and, you know, seeing everyone in their diving kit and sort of swimming around them. So I was exposed to it from a very, very young age. Amazing. And so your your adventures over the past few years has taken you all over the world from Indonesia to Australia. Um, Mm. What sort of um, trips have you been doing with your studies? So my first big expedition was to Indonesia and that was back in, gosh, 2017 now. I can't believe it. Time just absolutely flies. And I was lead scientist on an expedition to the Coral Triangle and I was there to assess plastic pollution in coral reef habitats, mainly on the surface. So I traveled there with a group of videographers and photographers from around the world and we started our journey in the Maluku Islands and so getting there was a logistical nightmare given the amount of people that were going on this trip. We were going to be three boats. I had all my science kits. We had, you know, people with just six bags of, you know, camera kit Um, and so the logistics of getting there was was pretty crazy. Um, But then when we arrived, we all got on the boat and spent 16 days traveling from Maluku to Rajaram Pat, which is the, you know, the marine biodiversity hotspot of the world. The Coral Triangle is just absolutely incredible. And so that was an incredible, incredible journey. I mean, I saw some 
things that I've never seen before. You know, I've, I got to see scalloped hammerhead sharks. I got to see mantas. Um, and I really can't quite describe just how incredible the reefs are there. They're just like any, like nothing else in the world. You know, if you want to go and see reefs in all their majesty, that is where you go. Oh, amazing. And so with that sort of expedition, were you with that big group? I mean, you must have seen some incredible things. Um, and in terms of the sort of studies that you were doing with microplastics, mm. yep. did, um, what did you sort of uncover? Essentially, that this area, which is normally thought of an incredibly pristine place, is impacted by plastic pollution. You know, what we found is that closer to the sort of built up areas. So when we were in Ambon, which is where we started our journey, there was, you know, lots of people living there. We found bigger bits of plastic, so bottles and plastic bags. But generally, as we got further away from land, all of the plastic became a lot smaller, but it was still there. And I think that's the really important point, um, although the important message that came from the trip is that even though, you know, the type of plastic might change, even when you're so far from land, there's plastic. And, you know, as as research is now showing, there's plastic on Everest, there's plastic in the poles, you know, it's just ubiquitously spread. Um, and I also found a very, very poignant piece of plastic, actually, which was a sticker that said made in the USA. And this just really supports the idea that plastic pollution is this global problem. And just because some things entered the ocean in one place doesn't mean that it stays there. You know, our oceans are, are connected and plastic moves around. And so it's a global issue and we all have that responsibility to sort of manage it, you know, in our countries to ensure that it isn't going to go on to, to impact areas, other places around the world. Good. And so with that sort of trip, you must have had some pretty, I mean, I've done um, deep, sea, deep sea, not deep sea diving. Um, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, how deep have you been? <laughs> um, and I mean, I, I absolutely love it. And, uh, you know, I, I did mine in Colombia, which was just incredible. We were on this sort mm. of island. But there must have been some sort of hairy moments along the way because you do this for a living. I mean, I yeah. did it on a sort of one off. Yes. So, you know, the nature of diving anyway is it's a dangerous sport. Things can go wrong when conditions are completely perfect. But Indonesia is a notorious place for currents and Rajaram Pat you know, people go there because of this, because of these currents. You have such a rich biodiversity on these reefs, but it's can be extremely dangerous. And I had one, I, I'd i say it was, it felt very much like life and death situation. One of those situations where, you know, if you did the wrong thing, you could quite easily get yourself into, yeah, die or, or get yourself into big trouble. So we were on a routine dive. We were going along a reef wall and every time before we got in the water, there would always be somebody that would go and do a quick recce and make sure that, you know, well, they would go and assess the current. And we'd been told that the current was mild. So all of our teams get in and people are going in to do the coral transects and the fish transects. And as I got in, I hadn't moved that far along this reef wall and then the current just hit. And it was as if I had just been placed on an elevator and just being whisked away. And all I could see is my dive leader sort of just disappearing. And fortunately, I guess three of us were close enough that we got kind of got swept away together. But at this point, we were still quite deep. And we had we had to make a, a decision about what we do. You know, naturally in this situation, you kind of want to try and let somebody know at the surface where you are because you're, you're being moved away from where you're supposed to be at quite a drastic rate, which can be extremely dangerous in this situation. You can get lost at sea. And unfortunately, we didn't actually have um, a long enough line for our DSMB, which is a delayed surface marker boy. So we call them safety sausages, essentially this big sausage that you, you fill with air, it, it, it floats at the surface and is basically this beacon to anybody on the surface saying, this is where I am, divers are here. But we only had five meters and we were at 15 meters and we're being swept. And so in just, you know, in that moment, we were like, right, we have to grab onto the reef. Neither of us, none of us had any reef hooks. So we just grabbed onto the nearest coral that we could find. I would never, ever, ever tell anyone to touch coral in any other situation. Never touch it. But we just grabbed on and the current was so, so strong that my goggles are going 
and my regs are going and I just start I'm starting to feel that fear you know the visibility's really dropped and it's just it felt like I was being hit by like 70 mile an hour winds and it felt like the longest 10 minutes of my life waiting we were like waiting hopefully to to re reconnect with our dive leader and my air's going down and I've got to about 50 bars and that's the point at which you should be on the surface you know you shouldn't really be surfacing with any less air than that and then just as I thought we were we were going to have to just let go of the reef and be swept away and try to get up to five meters and put up our surface marker boy there, my dive leader appeared and um, he thankfully had a, a long enough um, string. And so he grabbed us. We all huddled together, let go of the reef and he, his sausage went flying up and in an instant the reef was gone. And that was, yeah, absolutely terrifying. And um, we did actually lose temporarily two people for an hour and they got swept a kilometer down the reef and that's just how crazy things can change in a split second when you're diving um and you you have to make really quick and kind of like logical decisions because it can it can be really a dangerous situation good and so uh, probably before we uh put everyone off diving um <laughs> <laughs> Your... It's amazing, I promise. <laughs> well, let, let, let's talk about some of the amazing moments because you're in one of mm. the most diverse reefs on the planet. What what did you see? So, I mean, one of probably the most breathtaking moments was seeing my first scalloped head hammer, uh, hammerhead sharks. Just absolutely incredible. You know, not just one, 18 of them were going along, you know, looking around at the reef and then just hear that characteristic ding 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 and that's someone sort of tapping on their tank to tell you look out to the big blue and just looked and there was these sharks just gliding towards us and naturally I don't know why but I just wanted to swim towards them so we just all kind of turned and just started swimming and then something spooked them and they were gone in an instant and that was, I think, amazing to see just how quickly they can move, you know, just you can just disappear um, as quick as they sort of appear. But just breathtaking to see such in incredible creatures like that. And I also had another beautiful moment where we were doing coral transects. And again, I heard the ding, 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 ding and looked and uh, uh, two mantas were swimming directly towards me. And I had my camera and I forgot to press record because I was just so taken in by this moment. And this manta came right up and did this barrel roll right in front of me. I could have, if I wanted to, touch it, but of course, never touch wildlife. Um, and just, yeah, can't quite put into words just how incredible that was never having never seen one before they are ginormous creatures but they're just gentle giants um and it's just the most magical experience seeing creatures like that in the water i think um there's there seems to be a sort of misconception about sharks where mm. people are terrified that they will attack you um but they don't uh well they mm. th they rarely do Rarely, very rarely. Um, I remember someone saying there were these two people about to go diving and they were sort of speaking to the instructor, telling him, you know, what about the shark? And he was like, well, statistically, more people die from coconuts falling on their head. So you should probably wear a helmet <laughs> yes. as you walk through the palm trees. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. They're completely misunderstood. I mean... Definitely, when you get in the water with a marine predator or with any predator, you get come close to any predator, you do need to respect that. They are predators after all, but sharks are not out there to, to get you. If anything, they're just very, very interested in you. Um, and I had a wonderful experience to actually getting in the water snorkeling with uh, blue sharks this summer in the UK. And, you know, these sharks were coming right up to us. And of course, they don't have any hands to work out what you are. Their nose is their kind of their sensory organ to sort of work out. And bumping is quite a normal thing to sort of ascertain what you are. And um, so, yeah, it's they're, they're hugely misunderstood. And I think um, the media does a brilliant job of trying to hype them up as these man eaters, but they're not. Yeah. Um, and so where else has the sort of marine adventures taken you? 
So um, it took me out to the Red Sea where I lived for a year in Saudi Arabia. Um, and whilst I was living out there, I had the opportunity to go on a number of scientific cruises. And um, that was incredible. You know, just, again, beautiful reefs, um, being at sea just in you know the red sea is a quite a calm sea in comparison to other areas and so we'd quite often just be on glassy just glassy waters diving in like 28 degree water sometimes even more just like having a bath with lots of beautiful fish swimming around you absolutely incredible but um more recently, I've been going on quite a lot of adventures um, here in the UK. So as we've all been stuck, stuck at home um, during everything that's been happening with this global pandemic, I think a lot of us have had to refocus, um, you know, our kind of adventures at home. And it's been such a brilliant year of discovery from me because I've been a culprit of dreaming of distant shores. Adventure has always entailed going abroad and going off to tropical locations. But actually what I've found is that you can have some amazing adventures right on your doorstep. Um, and so, yeah, it's been wonderful. And I've gone off on a couple of really, really cool adventures um, between lockdowns. But of course, right now, marooned at home. I saw that you were sort of getting into wild swimming in the UK. Yes. Yes, I've been doing a lot of wild swimming and I've been actually getting in over winter, which is an incredible experience. Uh, much different from getting in in summer, that's for sure. Yeah, I'm I'm not the best in cold water, but I do try and force myself into it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just as long as you're doing that safely, you're not just, you know, throwing yourself in the water and shocking your body because that can be pretty dangerous. But yeah, it's it's brought me so much escape during this pandemic um it's been a wonderful way to sort of stay connected with nature do something good for myself and for my mental health um and yeah have an excuse to get outside yeah no exactly and so your plan um after lockdown is to travel the uk and show the best bits of it yeah, so um, as I mentioned, you know, I've been going on a lot of adventures here on on my home soil. So actually last year before, literally right before the pandemic hit, I was about to embark on a journey around the UK and my idea behind it was to circumnavigate the UK under my own steam. It was meant to be, you know, a carbon neutral or like, you know, trip and I wanted to raise awareness for marine wildlife here in the UK and really showcase what we've got because like I said I've dreamt of distant shores all my life but actually I think if we want to make the biggest difference in our world we need to be you know aware of what's around us aware of what's on our doorstep and need to fall in love with it to really sort of help protect it here is where we can make the biggest impact so Unfortunately, COVID hit and I couldn't go on that adventure and I've still not been able to go on that adventure. But I got to about July and just decided that, you know, there's no no light at the end of the tunnel for this. So why don't I just go off and do these adventures? So I launched my Saltwater Britain series on YouTube, which is all about me going off on adventures to experience the, you know, the best marine wildlife experiences out there here in the UK. Um, and so I went and swam with blue sharks i went and uh, snorkeled with basking sharks i went and found otters on the isle of mull and i also went and dived with seals in the far islands um so yeah four incredible adventures and it's been such a hit people have absolutely loved this series and that's definitely part of the plan for this year is to continue that series on youtube uh, so where whereabouts are you planning on going all over. So at the moment, I'm looking at going to Anglesey to do some diving around there. Um, I'm also looking at going down to Cornwall and doing doing a week down there. But I'm also going to be doing quite a lot of diving in Pembrokeshire. So all over, basically. Um, I'm going to be leading an expedition around Pembrokeshire at the end of May, beginning of June, on a sailing boat called Merlin um, as part of... Uh, so there's an organization called Sail Britain that take people out on expeditions around the British Isles. And uh, we're going to be going visiting Skomer Island and lots of different, you know, biodiversity hotspots down there in Pembrokeshire and hopefully go and see things like spider crab aggregations um, and 
go and see seagrass, the new seagrass restoration that's been happening down there. So yeah, it's probably not necessarily going to be going in search of the big charismatic species. It's going to be more about really showcasing the variety of ocean adventure that you can have and even really singing about the smaller animals and the less the less sexy species because <laughs> they're equally as amazing. Being a marine biologist, it's been pretty difficult working from home. I mean, can a marine biologist work from home? Absolutely. I think there's this huge misconception that to be a marine, well, I think we'd all love to spend all our time outside, but actually there's this misconception that, you know, marine biologists spend all their time diving. But really, there's there's lots of different data that we can get our hands on that we don't ever have to leave our offices um, to attain. So there's you know, for example, the research that I've been doing has been a big analysis of all of the published data on plastic in marine sediments globally. So what we're trying to answer is where is plastic going in our oceans? What is the ultimate sink of plastic pollution? Because we know that a huge amount of plastic is entering our oceans. There's only a certain amount that can be accounted for floating. And so we want to work out where it's going. And this obviously has implications for our understanding of like how we manage habitats. Is it being ingested? And so that's essentially meant I've never had to leave home. All I've had to do is just go online, collect all of the data from these papers and then do an analysis. And this is, of course, you know, research in the, the marine science sphere. Um, and so, yeah, you don't, you don't have to leave home at all. And I suppose for people who are listening to this, who are interested in marine biology, what do they need? Well, there's lots of different avenues into marine biology. I would argue, though, that now it has become a prerequisite to have a degree. It, but like me, it's not a necessity to necessarily go and do marine biology. You can do a different kind of degree. Like me, I did conservation biology where you, you know, learn about lots of different habitats and, and methods for conserving biodiversity. But then you can go on to specialize after that. And then that's what I did for my master's. But if you want to be an academic, if you want to do research, definitely getting a degree is the way forward. But then, you know, there's lots of different branches of marine biology. There's lots of people that work in conservation. So some people, you know, end up working for organizations or NGOs by just simply having a passion and getting in in the door with, you know, rescue centers or, or various different projects and sort of learn the skills on the ground. So really, there's no set recipe for getting into into it. And like I said, there's lots of different areas. Like if you want to be an educator, for example, you don't have to go and get a marine biology degree. You can you could simply if you wanted to do marine science communication, I know a lot of people that have got lit literary degrees. So they've done English literature at university, but have that passion for the ocean and have then moved in com into communication. So yeah, it's it's you can you can get into it lots of different ways. But I think the most important thing is just perseverance and passion. Okay, there we go. Um, and so with the conservation that you do, are you hopeful about the future or are you slightly pessimistic? I think if I didn't remain slightly hopeful, then I probably wouldn't be able to keep doing what I'm doing. I am hopeful because every day I do see people doing wonderful things. And, you know, for example, in Texas, there's been loads of turtles that have washed up uh, because temperatures in, have dropped so low that they've basically, you know, these turtles have just been rendered immobile. But the local community has come together and just, you know, saved over 2,500 turtles. And I see moments like that where I'm like, look, if people just... If people kind of made this effort every day and, you know, if when we come together for wildlife, we really can make such a huge difference. And so I remain hopeful because there are so many people out there that are doing so many great things. And I feel like we are armed with the tools and the ability to, to connect and communicate more than we ever have in, you know, our own history. And so we have everything that we need to make a difference. Um we just need to have the will to do it. And that's what I really hope to see in the next decade is people sort of really realizing their own value and, and that we need everyone. We don't need just marine biologists or people with science backgrounds. We need lawyers. We need engineers. You know, we need school teachers. We need everyone behind it. Yeah, I think when we had Lizzie Daly on the show, 
Um, mm. We were speaking about the sort of coexistence between wildlife and humans. And, yeah. you know, um, it's a very sort of challenging time because of the, um, you know, growing population. But mm. I think I think when there's a will, there's a way. Absolutely. And sure, you know, there are so many horrific stories out there. We're losing biodiversity at an astronomical rate. You know, the climate emergency is real and it's progressing and we have a very finite time to make, you know, make the changes that we need to really save our world as it is. But I just am hopeful that hopefully people will really start to wake up and as you say where there's a will there's a way yeah well charlie there's a part of the show where we ask the same five questions to each guest each week yep um with the first being on your trips what's the one gadget that you always take with you camera absolutely take my camera everywhere i mean that's my passion through and through is telling the story of my work and the whole idea behind everything I do is is going off on these adventures to showcase the wildlife with a purpose to inspire people and if I can't capture it on film then you know I can't take it back to people so absolutely camera comes everywhere with me yeah I think I'm pretty much the same as well (laughs) yeah (laughs) it's a necessity what camera do you use So I pretty much rock on a GoPro. It is the most useful and easiest thing. Like you see people with these really expensive underwater setups, but I think people are quite jealous of me when I literally just whip out my GoPro and just plop in the water and that's it. It's just simple and and the results are fantastic. But I would like to get more expensive kit in the future, but for now a GoPro does me just fine. Amazing. Uh, What is your favorite adventure or travel book? So this might be slightly cliche, but I absolutely love David Attenborough's Adventures of a Young Naturalist. I read that in the last couple of years and it just resonated with me so much because he actually visited places that I've since gone on to visit and hearing his stories and then kind of comparing that with the experience that I had was just amazing. And, you know, he really is the inspiration behind why I I got into what I'm doing. And his accounts are just so raw. And I have so much respect for how they managed to do anything that they did. And almost like the blind trust that they had in situations that now would terrify me. For example, there's a beautiful part where he gets on a rickety wooden boat and travels between Java and Bali. And they find out halfway that the captain's never done this before. He has no idea what he's doing. And they're just on this boat in the, like in the sea, not knowing where they're going, hoping that they're going to find their way. And David thinks it's a great idea. He'll just tie a bit of rope onto him and just jump in and takes a look at all the coral reefs that's go, you know, that they're, they're passing over and just, Oh, it fills me with just so much inspiration. And I I think I'm in awe of, you know, everything that he's done, but also it's like a time capsule. It's a world that I probably never get to see because, of course, we've lost so much. Um, And so, it it, yeah, it transports me back to a time when we had a lot more wild. And I guess it it makes me hopeful that one day we might have a wild like it again. Um, Why are adventures important to you? Adventures are important to me because they they provide me with an opportunity to sort of like break out of the ordinary and experience the extraordinary. That's kind of how I want to live my life is I don't want an ordinary life. I want an extraordinary life. And I feel like it expands and broadens your mind. Like every time I go away, I learn something new, I experience something different, and it completely gives you an entirely new and organic perspective on the world. And I think it makes you just think differently um it's just a a beautiful thing i i think having lived and worked around the world and seen that you know everyone around the world no matter if culture divides us everyone's a mother father sister brother you know everyone laughs everyone you know has their quirks their hobbies and it's just i think a beautiful thing adventure gives you that opportunity to to sort of learn about your place in the world yeah i so i um no, I think I think you're right there. I think um, you know emotions and are universal. I I study sort mm. of psychology, and we looked at sort of 
you know, even a blind person when he wins the 100 meter race will put his arms up like a person who's won a race. Wow, yeah. Who's already won a race in the 100 meters who's not blind. It's sort of, they're these universal things that people, you know, whether you're from Saudi Arabia or the UK, they're all yeah. the same. They bind us. Yeah, it binds us. Um, well, that first part was a pretty good quote, I thought. So this probably leads quite nicely on to the next part, which is, what is your favourite <laughs> quote? <laughs> well, I mean, I don't even know if that's that's a quote. I I, I I feel like I've just kind of made it up for myself. But my fav- one of my favourite quotes is from one of my favourite books, The Alchemist, and it's, wherever your heart is, there you will find your treasure. And I'm a true believer that if you are following your dreams or sort of, you know, doing what you love, that the world will transpire to sort of make things happen for you. And I couldn't do anything else other than what I'm passionate about or what I love. You know, I think time is the most valuable thing that you have in your world and, you know, you need to use it wisely. And I really do believe that if you follow your heart, you will, you'll find that treasure in your life. Yeah, I, uh, I agree. Although the uh, extraordinary, to, uh, the ordinary to the extraordinary, I thought was very good as well. So you could probably claim. Thank you. You could probably claim that as yourself. I might claim it. Yeah. <laughs> Put a little quote with the uh, with your name under and go. I said this, by the way. <laughs> that's how it works, right? You just tell people that's what you've said, and then. I, I think, and then people just share it online, and then you're like, yes, perfect. I got, I got one. Brilliant. <laughs> there we go. Um, people listening are always keen to travel. What's the one thing you would recommend them to get started? Is make a list and then take that first leap. I swear that it's the hardest part of trying to plan an adventure. I think quite often we live in our heads and until you actually get those ideas down on paper, they quite often don't come alive. And you need to set time aside to just completely immerse yourself in thinking about what you want to go and do. And then once you've got this list and you've decided on something, book that ticket or, you know, book that flight and that will be the biggest hurdle. And once you've committed to that, the rest comes. Um, But it's just about taking that first step and taking that plunge. Very good. Um, Thank you. (laughs) What are you doing now and how can people follow you in the future? So um, I am all over socials. So everybody can follow along on my adventures on Instagram. My handle is Ocean Magpie. Um, And likewise, I'm now dabbling in YouTube and going to be really pushing all of um, my adventures on there. So I'm going to be going out and creating lots of adventure content. So go and check me out on YouTube. Um, and please tune in and watch the Saltwater Britain adventures and, and hopefully it'll inspire anyone here in the UK to go off and explore what's on their doorstep. Amazing. Um, why Ocean Magpie? <laughs> well, it's because one, love the ocean, but my dad would call me his little magpie. Um, and it's, I guess, a kind of way, you know, I go off and search for awesome shiny things in the ocean i mean not just shiny things but i guess yeah as i have a bit of a i guess a magpie spirit that loves the ocean oh that's really nice um well charlie thank you so much for coming on today absolutely loved hearing your stories and um yeah i look forward to seeing your youtube channel grow and the adventures that you get up to in saltwater britain Thank you so much. And uh, for anyone else, go check her out on YouTube and Instagram and enjoy. Thank you so much. Take care. Well, that is it for today. Thank you so much for watching and I hope you got something out of it. If you did, hit that like button and subscribe if you haven't already. And I will see you in the next video.